All right, hello everyone, this is Mr. Kirsch. I'm gonna go over what we went over in class today in case you were gone. Um, again, your homework that's due on Monday, you've had it all week, is basically two practice tests. Assignment number one and two are 45 questions here, then the six for your response, just like you're gonna do on the AP test, and then 45 questions and six. And you can get to all of them. All of them have videos, so they are all explained in depth with all the work and the correct answer, so try them and then watch the videos to see um, if you were right. Uh, your goal, I think at this point, our goal should be to get two thirds of the multiple choice questions correct. On your, on your first attempt at these right here, you should be trying to get two thirds of them correct as a good goal. Because our, our goal is to pass the AP with a three, four, or five. Um, if you can do this, pretty well set there. And the other goal is to understand understand two-thirds of the free response questions. Now most of the free response questions have uh, multiple parts and they are challenging and out of the A, B, and C when you attempt it for the first time you might um, really know how to do one part. And then two of the other parts you may not know how to do but after watching the video hopefully you can understand them. So if you don't get them right away it's not a problem. Watch the video. Hopefully you can understand them. And then there's usually always that one problem on there where it's going to be very, very difficult. And if you don't quite understand it, that's going to be fine. We'll still be able to reach our goal of a three or four or five as long as you're understanding two-thirds of it. So don't feel like you have to know these the first time around. Just try them. At least pick out one of the parts that you can do. And then watch the video for explanation on the other two. And then if you can attempt that last part... Um, that would be great too, but try and keep those two goals in mind as you do your work. All right, um, for our reference sheet, the stuff we did in class today, uh, we went over the trig derivative, trig derivative is again, and the sine, derivative of sine is cosine, and cosine is negative sine, and tangent is secant squared, and secant is um, secant tangent. Now, how do you remember these? Well, the first two are pretty basic. I think we have all of those. But what I remember here is the letters T, S, and S. Because both of these have one tangent and two S's. One tangent and two S's. So one tangent, two S's, one tangent, two S's. And the same thing down here, but it's all, it's a cotangent and two secants. And so this one, if you have a cotangent, well, you're left with two cosecants, so those go there. We should put this squared right there. And if you have one cosecant, well, you're left with a cosecant and a cotangent. But the problem here is these need to be negative. All of the ones that start off with a C have negative answers. There's a negative here, 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 all of the ones that are the cofunctions. So negative, negative, negative. Now, when we get to the trig, the inverse derivatives, a little bit harder to remember, but there is a kind of a pattern to it. They're all fractions. They all have ones up here. And this one is one plus x squared. And down here, we have, whoops, got that one backwards already. This one is the square root of one minus x squared. And this one is the one plus the x squared. And this one down here is an x and that x squared minus 1. So those are all the derivatives. Again, don't forget, though, that you do have to do the chain rule with all of these. So if it's just x, well, the derivative of just x is 1. But if this was something else, you could have something else up here. So we always have to put the derivative up there. But we're going to leave it off in this case. So that's that. And then what happens for all of these? Well, I didn't give you a separate formula because these are all the co-1s and they stay the same, they just become negative. So if you want to do the cosine inverse, you just throw a negative sign out in front of those ones. So um, that's how you can remember those. You want to study those? I'm sure there'll be a few of those on the test. All right, last thing I want to talk about is this problem that's kind of common. Um, if you look at a lot of the story problems, they, they follow this, this plan. And the plan is it's a leaky bucket problem. There's a bucket full of water. It's leaking out at the bottom, but it's being filled up at the top. We have a function for the filling rate, 
We have a function for the leaking rate right here. So the water is going up and down, some in, some out. And it's a very common type of problems. Um, if you look at the free response question, I believe it's question one on one of the years. It's about a pond and it's about fish going in and out of the pond. So there's a pond, fish going in, fish going out. All right, well, what would this be? If I did it, if I integrated from zero to five of this entering one, well, this would be the amount of water, amount of water going in, right? Over five hours, over this five hour period, that's the amount of water going in. Well, what would it be if I integrated it from five to eight of the leaking function, but I times it by one third? Well, that would be the average amount leaving each hour over that interval. So average amount here, total amount there. But here's the really important question here. What is the amount of the water in the bucket after three minutes? Well, a lot of people do this the first time they try this. Zero to three of the entering function, which makes sense, minus the leaking function, which makes sense. But then they forget that it had a starting amount. It had that constant. So it's a constant value plus this change right here. So make sure you always add on a constant. If you're integrating a rate and there's already some water there, you have to add that. All right, let's take a look at the graph of this. If I graph this scenario here, and here's a graph of the velocity of the function. Um, at one minute, I have a lot of water going in, a little bit of water coming out. At two minutes, a lot of water entering, a little bit leaving and so on and so forth. And I can measure those distances down here. But there comes to this point right here where the amount of water entering is equal to the amount of water leaving. So what is that point? Well, two things. That's where there's no change. There's no change in the water level, right? Because um, that you have water coming in, water going out at the exact same rate. There's no change right there. But then the follow-up question is, well, what else does that mean? Well, that turns out to be the max water level. And you may it may not look like a maximum right here because it definitely doesn't look like a maximum. It looks like an intersection, but that's the maximum water level. And I can probably show it to you best with this position graph down here. If this is the amount of water in the tank, at one minute, I have water coming in a lot and a little bit leaving, so the water goes up. At two minutes, same thing. Water in, water out. At three minutes, same deal. A lot coming in, less going out. But what happens right here at four minutes? Well, the graph stops. And now we have more water leaking than coming in, so the value goes down. So this graph, and it would be a curve, it would curve up and it would curve down at a maximum value right there. So at four minutes, there's a maximum value. On the position graph, it definitely looks like a maximum value. But when you're talking about a graph of derivatives, it looks like this. So this translates to here. Sometimes it's difficult to go back and forth between the graphs. I suggest you draw them out and really talk about what this means and what that point is. I'll give you one more graph. I had someone graph this equation. f of x is equal to the e function minus the l function. And it looked like this. At minute four, it was going down. Because we were gaining water, then we were losing water, and right there, nothing happened. So depending on how you graph it, um, the maximum will appear in different ways. But um, when you have a position graph, that's the maximum. There's a velocity. All right, that's what we covered in class today for your notes. Make sure you study those. Uh, for the AP test, again, you're supposed to be in the library at 7.30. The test starts at 8. And I will be at school. I will have donuts and drinks at 6.45. You're welcome to come down. Before that, I'll reset your calculator, and then you can head over to the library. All right, good luck. Study as much as you can. Take these two practice tests. And last thing, um, we said our final, which is on Tuesday, um, comes from that one. 
and that one. So all of your final questions will go back to there. Um, it'll be 25 questions. You'll be given a calculator. All right. Good luck. Study hard this weekend, and I will see you Monday morning.